All right, part two, what we're gonna talk about here is give you some further examples of how this stuff works, and I'll uh, describe it in terms of how it's applied to Java and uh, Java Atomic Long. So Java uses compare and swap extensively in the virtual machine implementation and in lower level portions of the Java Util Concurrent Locks package, and also, for that matter, Java Concur Util Concurrent, because there's some synchronizers like semaphores that lurk in a different package or in a parent package. And so we're going to see how compare and swap long is used. Compare and swap long is something that's part of the, the unsafe class, which you can read about at this link. And as I mentioned before, and as you saw just a minute ago, it allows us to atomically set a memory location at an offset from an object, we'll talk more about that in a second, to a given updated value if and only if the current value at the memory location equals the expected value. So this is very similar to what we looked at before with the general discussion of compare and swap, except now we're gonna be talking about it in terms of what Java's doing as opposed to kind of what happens at the hardware level. And here's the method, compare and swap long. As you can see, it's part of the unsafe class, which you don't get direct access to, but many parts of Java class libraries do in fact get access to it. So you can see here that it takes four parameters, uh, expected and updated, we already talked about. You hopefully have a good feeling for that. Object and offset are a little bit different, and I'll talk about how that works in a second. So uh, the atomic long class, which is one of the classes that are part of the atomics package, uses compare and swap long. And if you take a look at the implementation, it has this really cool pattern that applies to all the different atomic classes. So atomic long works this way. Atomic Boolean works this way, Atomic Integer, Atomic Double, they all basically have the same pattern for how they are implemented. And what they do is they use Java Reflection. You can read more about Java Reflection here. Java Reflection is a very powerful but somewhat mysterious and complicated part of the Java language that allows you to programmatically inspect certain fields and properties of your classes and objects at runtime in order to do various things to them. Uh, for example, the Makito tests that we have as part of the Palantiri simulator that we just talked about a little while ago, those heavily use reflection in order to be able to mock your code and check for certain properties. It's really, really cool. How we use it here, we define a volatile long value. That's the thing that's the atomic long, right? And in the static initializer portion of the class, this, this piece of code here that says static, open curly brace, close curly brace, this gets executed once per class. And what that's, or sorry, per, uh, let's see, per, but what gets executed once per class. And what it does is it goes and it uses object field offset, which is a method in the unsafe class, and it uses the atomic long class get declared field reflection method in order to find out the offset where the value field occurs in the object. And again, this is kind of getting into compiler level stuff, but what happens when you have a class is each of its fields are stored at offsets from the beginning of the object, right? So if you have an object that's at location 1,000, then the fields will start at, say, let's say, you know, 1004, depends if there's some extra magic stuff in the object, like a V pointer or virtual pointer or whatnot. But it'll start at, let's say, 1004. And so what this is doing is it's getting the value offset from the start of the class, and it's stashing it away in a static final long. And what that means is that it's final, so it won't change after it's initialized. It's static, which means there's only one instance per in each instance of atomic long, so it's a class variable, and this value is being set in the initializer. So that's basically what's going on there. Not necessarily something you have to have deep knowledge of, but it's how it works under the hood, and it's pretty cool. All right, so what we're doing is we're stashing the offset of the value field into a static field. Just keep that in mind. And let's say, for sake of argument, let's say it has the value four. So it's an offset four from the start of the object. Okay, so now let's take a look at a method that's provided in the unsafe class. This is called get and add long. And what this does is it's going to use compare and swap long in order to automatically update 
a value at an offset into an object. What the heck does that mean? Well, let's take a look at an example. So what's going to happen here is we're going to pass in an object, O, and an offset and a delta. So what is the object? Well, what the object is going to be in this case is it's going to be an instance of atomic long in this case. So that's, that's the object that we have. That's the, and, and you can see why in a second this is an unsafe class, because this is kind of reaching around and playing around with memory locations that Java, the language TM, doesn't want you, the programmer, mucking around with, because it's trying to provide you with type safety, and they don't want you just reading and writing to arbitrary parts of memory. And that's why it's part of the unsafe class, which is otherwise hidden from you, the application developer, although the class library developers have access to it. So here we have compare and swap long. Remember, this is the lock-free call that runs atomically. All right, keep in mind, that's, we've already talked about that. As you can see, it's going to take the object, the offset, the expected value, and the updated value. And we'll talk about those in a second. So offset, if you recall, is relative to the start of the object. So going back over here, assuming we're going to use atomic long for this, then the object will be an instance of atomic long, and the offset will be the value, the value offset of the value field, which let's say for sake of argument is four. Okay, so we're passing in the address of the atomic long and the offset from that object in memory where we want the compare and swap comparison to be made. So this is really low level C assembly code kind of stuff. And then we go ahead in a loop. We're going to loop. And you'll see what we're going to loop for in a second. And every time through the loop, we're going to go ahead and get the value that is at the offset from that object. So think about the object as just being a pointer in memory. And we're going to index that many bytes into memory from that starting point. And we're going to grab whatever the heck the value is there, and we're going to stash it into an int called v. This is a local variable called v. So that's getting the current value of the value field. That's what it's logically doing in our example. And then what we're going to do is we're going to check to see if the current value that we fished out here is still the current value when we call compare and swap long. And if it is in fact the same value, then we're going to atomically add some delta to it which could be 1, it could be negative 1, it could be 50, it could be negative 500, whatever, right? Here's where we're using the fact that compare and swap long can take arbitrary values, right, as opposed to just always setting it to 1, which is what test and set would have done. Okay, so keep in mind we're doing that. Now, the interesting question here is why do we loop? Why are we looping here? What's the reason for the loop? I mean, we just checked, we just got the value of v, why on earth would the value of v we just read here in the loop not have the same value by the time we get to the compare and swap call? Cool. Bingo, exactly. So the, the observation here is that, you know, this is user code, right? This is not that you don't see any lock anywhere here. Right? There's no synchronizer that says synchronized or acquire lock over this whole region. You know, we don't have a spin lock here. This is the spin lock, in fact. And between the point where v is assigned here and where it's checked there, even though that's probably an infinitesimal you know, nanosecond in time, someone might have snuck in in the meantime and changed the value of the field at the offset from that object. So between here and there, even though those things are really, really close in time and space, they might have changed. And if that's the case, then this comparison and swap long will fail, it'll return false, and we'll loop back around again and try again. So what this is doing is this is taking into account what might happen if there is contention for that value. And all contention means here is that multiple threads slash multiple cores are simultaneously trying to write to that value. They're, they're simultaneously trying to increment it by a certain amount. And we want to make sure that we do it atomically. So we only make a change 
if the value is the value that we thought it was, not if it's changed to something between those points when we checked and when we acted. And this is very important to remember when you deal with concurrency is check and act race conditions. And this is an attempt to avoid that. I mean, it's not just an attempt, it's the way to avoid it using low level spin lock capabilities. Okay, so now that we've got get and add long, now that that primitive has been built on top of compare and swap long, we can now write some methods in atomic long. And so here's a method called get and increment, and here's a method called get and decrement. And you can see that get and increment uses get and add long, and it adds one to the value offset for this object, right? So it adds one to value. And you can see that get and decrement adds minus one to that value, right? So it's it's subtracting one, it's adding minus one, so it's subtracting one. So we only need to have one operation, get and add long, but it'll work either for incrementing or decrementing. And we can actually increment or decrement by arbitrary amounts. This is just doing it by one. Um, so that's pretty cool. So you can see how these things layer on each other. So now that we started with hardware instructions for compare and swap, we built the unsafe class to wrap that with compare and swap long. We then added the get and add long method on top of compare and swap long, and then we add get and add decrement, get and, or sorry, get and increment, get and decrement. We add those things on top of that. So these are just really, really super efficient layers that are being put on top of what's built underneath. So uh, this is very powerful. It's very efficient if there's low contention. In other words, if there's not multiple threads that are trying to write to this thing at the same time, to this memory location at the same time, then Compare and swap is ridiculously efficient. It's often just you know, one hardware instruction, so it's blazingly fast. The problem arises with contention. So if you have a lot of contention, a lot of threads trying to write to the same object, then you get yourself into trouble. And that's where you end up with lots of busy waiting, right? Which is the gerbil running on the wheel and, and really not getting anywhere. However, some spinning can actually be useful in modern multi-core processors. And I strongly recommend if you have an hour or, or half an hour of time, if you play it at 2x speed, go listen to this talk by Doug Lee, who is the, the guru, the godfather of uh, Java concurrent and parallel programming. Well, well versed in patterns and parallelism and all kinds of great things. He gives a talk where he talks about all the stuff that we've just discussed. He, he probably does a better job of explaining it than I do, but um, he doesn't go step by step. So. He talks about why modern libraries for multi-core platforms use spinning, use compare and swap, quite heavily. And the reason is they're trying to avoid context switching that occur if you need to use sleep locks, if you need to sleep or park yourself somewhere. And I think we've talked before about how they're actually adaptive, so they'll spin a little bit, and then if they aren't making any progress, then they'll back off and sleep. So you don't just spin mindlessly. But they try their very hardest to only sleep if there's absolutely nothing else they can do to make forward progress. Okay, so that's the end of the discussion of atomic classes and operations.